if you're one of those people that finds the sort of um, bashing of religion and stuff tiresome or uh, offensive, just give me five more minutes. Oh, swing your partner by the hand, have a baby if you can. But if the voices in your head say to sacrifice your kid, to satiate your loving God's fetish for dead baby blood, it's simple faith the book demands. So raise that knife up in your hands. And the children of Israel again did evil and said the Lord when Ehud was dead, in that they plowed their fields with two different kinds of barn animals unequally yoked together. Hmm. I see there is absolutely no mention of Shamgar, son of Anna, the judge of Israel who came after Ehud, vis a vis the last verse of chapter 3. But no matter. And the Lord sold them, as she was wont to do from time to time, such as when the children of Israel broke one of her incessant, ever changing commands into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, another historical figure who most certainly existed as described, even though he also appeared nowhere else in any archaeological or historical records outside of the Bible. Jabin reigned in Hazor, and that will just have to take my word for it. The captain of whose host was Sisera, which, once again I think the Bible means who, dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And of course, that maketh much sense, given that it was the Gentiles' land before Israel decided to use their belief in Todd as an excuse to kill the original inhabitants and take them over, all under the auspices of unilateral UN support. And the children of Israel cried, for they dropped their ice cream cones, unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. Of course, the way that the sentence is structured, it appears that the Lord had 900 chariots of iron, and not Jabin or Sisera. But anyway, twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel, and once again it appeared that the Lord was the one doing the oppressing. You know, like she normally does. And Deborah, a prophetess, which is a unique bit of information, seeing that prophetesses had not been mentioned in the Bible prior to this point. The wife of Lapidoth, of whom we have no pertinent information. She judged Israel at this time. This was mostly because Lapidoth did not put his foot down and assert himself like he was supposed to, and he did not tell Deborah to go back into the kitchen and start making sandwiches. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah instead of in the kitchen making sandwiches between Rabbah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for her judgment, mostly about how to get a stain out of their favorite's shirt. And she sent and called Barak, which maketh the entire Republican Party cringe, as they now know that Barak is a Christian name, drawn directly out of the Bible, so a certain president of the United States is not a secret Muslim after all. And she called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord taught of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men, of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulon. And Barak, the son of Obama, looked confused and started flipping through the pages of the Bible. And he answered and said to Deborah, Bloody hell, I don't see that commandment anywhere in here. Doth thou have a scripture reference for that commandment? And Deborah said, Hast thou not been paying any bloody attention? I am a prophetess, which meaneth that I can simply make up shit as I go along, and thou art just going to have to go along with it and follow every word with the simple basic assumption that everything I say is accurate and not contradictory word of Almighty God. Besides, this is one of those prophecies that are spoken and not written, a loophole continuously exploited by a great number of Christian apologists. And who dost thou think thou art arguing against thy spiritual leader? And Barak said, Oh no, this is not argumentation. This is peer review, which is highly valued in academic circles. Deborah scouted him and answered, This is not academia, this is religion, which means that thou wilt do whatever the hell I tell thee, or thou wilt find thyself out of a job come the next election day. And Barack, the son of Obama, answered, Oh, very well, I'll do it. And Deborah said, That's a good boy. And I will draw unto thee into the river of Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, for most assuredly Jabin will be too chicken to fight the battle himself. And I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, 
Mm, that seems legit, even though women were normally buck or all worth mentioning in the Bible, particularly in leadership positions. If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go, for I will need some I can't be hanging off my arm. Besides, we do need someone who will stay in the tent and make sandwiches. And she said, I will surely go with thee, but I will not be making sandwiches. Notwithstanding, the journey that thou takest will not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And that will teach thee never to question my authority again. And Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak said, This deal is getting worse and worse all the time. And he called Zebulon and Naphtali to Kadesh. And he went up with ten thousand men at his feet, which is the exact number that Deborah said that Todd said he needed. It. And Deborah went up with them, all the while resisting the temptation to run back into the kitchen and stand behind a hot stove. Now, Heber in this narrative is also only important because he is the husband of his wife. And I challenge thee right now, without looking or placing the search bar at the start of the video, tell to me the name of Deborah's husband. Go on, admit it. Thou remembers not what his name was. Oh, bloody hell, now the curiosity is eating away at thee. Thou will spend the rest of this video trying to remember the sorry bloke's name and pay bugger all attention to any of the further attempts at humor and satire in this narrative. So go ahead and look it up. Don't worry. I'll wait. Do -do -do, do -do 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 -do. Give up? His name was Lapidoth, the husband of Deborah. Not that it matters anyway. It is not like he was all that Todd damn important. And Heber, the husband of the only other woman mentioned in this chapter, the Kenite, a minority ethnic group that has not been mentioned since chapter 1, which, again, I think the Bible means who, was of the children of Hohab, the father-in-law of Moses, one of his names anyway, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh, which is most definitely not a run-on sentence. Of course, it would seem rather silly to insert this one tiny little verse in the middle of this chapter, considering that it appears to have absolutely no connection to anything else in this narrative. Now, I would normally be inclined to label such a verse as an interpolation, edited into the text after the fact to suit the political or religious goals of powerful leaders. However, in this particular case, this verse becomes important later in this chapter, or rather, Hebrew's wife becomes important, and I felt that thou did not know her name either. And they, whoever they are, as once again this completely accurate and non-contradictory book of stupid is not exactly a stickler for important details. They shooed, 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 showed. Anyway, they shooed Sisera that Brock, son of Obama, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and had a race, and all the people that were with him, from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon, and of course thou knowest exactly where those two locations are. And Deborah, who for some unexplained reason was still not barefoot and pregnant, said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has made, in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand, and not a word about whether or not I can prove such a bold sweeping statement, back it up with evidence, or at least provide a scriptural reference for it. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? And Barak, son of Obama, looked out into the battlefield, but the Lord was nowhere to be found. For though Deborah did tell the Lord where the battle was to be held, with an email message, a Facebook post, a YouTube video, Flyers posted all over town, an official naval message sent through proper channels, and a badass black process server with thick sunglasses who pounded on her door, shoved the paper into her chest, and said in a loud, booming voice, You've been served. For some reason, the Lord still did not show up. And the process server did complain to the television cameras how hard his job was. So Barack, knowing that the Lord wasn't going to do a her damn thing, suddenly realized that he was going to have to do this all by himself. He went down from Mount Tabor, 
and 10,000 men after him, all pissed off to no end, because they did not get the sandwiches that they were promised. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots with the, all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Barak said unto the Lord, Well, it's about bloody time it showed up. And the Lord said unto Sisera, Piss off, I was playing World of Warcraft and just got my Goblin Shadow Priestess up to level 85, which is so much more important than what you bastards are doing down here. While they were arguing with each other, Sisera lighted off his chariot and led away on its feet, sneaking off on his tippy toes trying not to make a sound. After a few paces, he accidentally stepped on a stick, which made a loud crack. He stopped dead in his tracks and looked around and breathed a sigh of relief when he saw that Brock and the Lord were still having a doubt. So Sisera got away unnoticed. But Barak pursued after the chariots, and after the host, unto Harosheth to the Gentiles. But the Lord went back to heaven, where she lodged unto her level 35 work in Druid. And all the hosts of Sisera fell on the edge of the sword, though whose sword they fell upon the Bible does not specify. I am going to surmise that they fell upon their own swords, like the Japanese samurai of old, who considered it a dishonor to be captured alive by the enemies. And there was not a man left, but there were women left, all of them in the kitchen, making sushi. Howbeit, Sisera fled away on his feet, unto the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. I told us thee that I would tell thee the name of Heber's wife. There was a peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite, but apparently Jael never got the message, for she crumpled up the piece of paper and threw it on the ground, even though the black guy with the thick shades had already informed her that she had been served. And Jael went out to meet Sisera, who said unto her, Get back into the kitchen. And she said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn into me, fear not, for I have ice-cold beers in the fridge, and I have made sandwiches. And when he had turned into her in the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Hey, this isn't a sandwich. Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk, and gave him drink, and covered him. And he said, What the bloody hell is wrong with you? I asked for water, not milk. Thou you broad, blondes never do anything right. Again he said unto her, Let's see if thou can do this one right. Stand at the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is any man here? That thou shalt say, No. See, this is one of those moral dilemmas that they teach about in philosophy class, in which any answer given is somehow wrong. Doth thou understand what I am asking? And Jael said, Well, no. Sis rest, What doth thou not understand? Jael replied, what does inquire mean? And Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail to the tent and took a hammer in hand, two tools she knew not how to use because she was a woman, and went softly into him and put the hammer to the side of his head and began to hit it with the nail. After two hours of doing this and nothing happened, she tried it the other way around. She smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. Oh, he died! And there it is, another delightful story suitable for younger readers in the Sacred Sweet family-friendly storybook. And behold, as Barak, son of Obama, pursued Sisera, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to stop. I thought Barak was pursuing the chariots and let Sisera get away scot-free. But never mind. Jael came out to meet him, and once again she was ordered to go back to the kitchen. And she said to him, Come, and I will shoo, shoo, shoo-ed, shoo, uh, I, I will shoo with the man who thou seekest. And he came into her tent, and behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. And the blood was gushing out everywhere, turning everything inside the tent to a nice bright shade of red. And although this particular verse saith nothing about fecal matter, like the last groups of death described in exhaustive detail in the previous chapter, we can fairly well assume that, ahem, the dirt came out this time as well. Of course, the Bible is the completely accurate, non-contradictory word of Almighty Todd. I have to tell thee that, or else thou will think that the next two verses directly contradict each other. But of course they don't. Somehow. 
So Todd subdued on that day Javan the king of Canaan before the children of Israel. Got that? Todd killed Javan, not the Israelites. Next verse. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Javan king of Canaan until they had destroyed Javan king of Canaan. So the Israelites killed Javan, not Todd. But Todd ignored this particular contradiction, for she had more important things to do. As her worgen druid reached level 36, she took the time to look around her apartment, for she thought that someone was slightly out of place. The room temperature was perfect, her Pepsi was ice cold, and her cat was comfortably resting upon her bookshelf. But something was not quite right. Suddenly it dawned on her what was wrong. Bloody hell, she said to Jeebus. Deborah never made me a sandwich. Morality is written there in simple white and black. I feel sorry for you heathens, got to think about all that. Good is good and evil's bad and goats are good and pigs are crap. You'll find which one is which and the good because it's good and it's a book and it's a book. Yeah.